All right, what were we doing last time? We were talking about this copy ordering system. And we had reached the point where we had thought about doing this as an entire inheritance hierarchy. And the inheritance hierarchy kind of fell apart as we realized that we needed a class that represented every combination of possible condiment that we could have with our base type. And that exploded the number of subclasses. And then we realized that in order to change this, we have to go make a bunch of classes anytime any of this changed. And it also didn't allow us to represent the associated cost of a drink with any ease whatsoever. So we made this design where we said, all right, let's factor instead of inheritance, let's use composition for the condiments. And that way we could figure out whether or not a a drink has each of those by looking at the Boolean fields now that are true if that drink has that condiment and false if that drink does not have that condiment. And then we'd have getters and setters that allow you to be able to order the drink. Did we get to thinking about the issues of this? I have the memory of a goldfish. If we did, what did we discuss? I think we talked about like how rigid it is relatively. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty rigid. It's you'd still have to be able to go back and make changes to this if you introduced more potential condiments, if you introduced more potential drinks, drink types. It wasn't great. So some of the issues we talked about, if there's a price change of some kind then we have to modify existing code in multiple places to be able to associate the price changes of each of the different, we have to go refactor the cost method in the superclass, potentially the cost methods in the subclasses, and there would be the opportunity to produce a bunch of bugs as we did that. And if we made new condiment types, we'd have to add new fields and alter the cost method of the superclass again as we did this. So we like open for extension, but closed for modification. Remember that rule from object-oriented programming? We don't want to modify existing stuff that we have made. We should just be able to extend it rather than modify it. Every new beverage may not want every existing condiment option. So if we made a potential drink like an iced tea, does it make sense to be able to order a mocha iced tea? or an iced tea with whipped cream, maybe that, <laughs> if it, if maybe, maybe you do, but maybe you don't. Maybe you don't necessarily wanna be able to pair those things because they would that particular pairing would be really gross. And if it appeared in the menu, someone would walk into your store, order that drink with that particular combination, go, ew, and then leave you a one-star review on Google just because you had that as an option that they could order and they didn't know better. So we talked about the open close principle. They should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So the way that we end up doing this needs to follow this principle and you want to adhere to this principle whenever you can. It will not always make perfect sense to do so, but you, if you're going to violate the open close principle, you should have a very good reason for doing so. A very good reason. So we should be able to change the behavior without modifying the existing code. These designs, of course, can be changed through extension, meaning that we'll add some classes to it or we'll add some functionality through those classes and that will change how it works. This means that they're resilient. If there's an issue or a bug with the system after the implementation, then it's because of the change that you made, not just the way that it interacts with the old code. If I almost kind of want to draw this in a graph form, you add a new thing and it can interact with every possibility of the old system and then something goes wrong, you have to think about how does this inter interact with class A? How does this interact with class B? How does this interact with class C? How does this interact with class D? And you're going back to all of the code, the old code in class A and B and C and D because the way that it was written may not work with the way that this new thing was written. And that just creates a massive headache. 
So instead, you want, if any bug is going to pop up, it should be due to the change that you just made. It's in the code that you just extended, not in the code that was extended. Your old code. There is usually a beware in this class. It's not just straight content. Should not necessarily be applied everywhere. If extension will never be necessary, then don't bother to encapsulate all of your classes in a way that is open to extension. Maybe this is just a hard set final product that will never need to be changed or extended at any point in the future. If that's the case, don't design around it. If you apply the open close principle, your code becomes more complex and difficult to understand, which goes back to that last point of if it's not necessary, don't make your code harder to understand. If you're going to adhere to the open close principle, have a reason for future extension, have a reason you're going to want to adhere to it to make that extension easier. All right, and it's finally time to reveal the actual decorator pattern. So we've motivated it by talking about this coffee company. Well, let's actually talk about how we can solve this issue in an intelligent way that's gonna look gross. That's kind of what design patterns are in general, right? They're intelligent solutions to problems that shouldn't exist. <laughs> At least that's how I like to think about them. <clears throat> so we'll take one of our instantiated subclasses. We have a dark roast object. This is just the base dark roast object, no condiments. We can query the cost by saying dark roast dot cost, and that gets us back the dark roast's cost. We're going to decorate it with a condiment. And you can kind of think of having this, this coffee, you're going to decorate the coffee with something. You're not changing the base of it being a dark roast, but you're changing an aspect of the final product. You're adding chocolate to it. You're adding caramel to it. You're adding whipped cream to it. Then you can decorate it with a whipped cream object. And if you call the cost method now, you delegate the cost to this decorated class. So you're going to kind of have a different scopes of the classes where the innermost class is your dark roast object. The next class out is going to be a chocolate object. And the next class out is going to be a whipped cream object. Then when you query cost, it will ask whipped cream, what's the cost? Which will ask chocolate, what's the cost? Which will act, ask dark roast, what's the cost? And then it will filter back out kind of recursively as it adds the cost of each ingredient to the total that started from the innermost object, that dark roast object. This is very similar. And in fact, I don't really ever call this the decorator pattern. I call it the wrapper pattern or wrapping pattern because we call things like the integer class the wrapper class for the primitive int, it's the exact same idea. You're taking an object and you're adding additional functionality outside of it by making that a field inside of a bigger class. So the integer is the actual field. The int is the field inside of the integer object. So a dark roast would be an object inside of the chocolate object. And the chocolate object would be a component of the whipped cream object so that we could continue to just do this process. And if it's in a decorator or it's in a wrapper, then you can easily strip away the layers to ask questions about the cost and put it back together to get the actual cost of the object. That is very small to see. But here is the basic idea. We start with the dark roast object that has a cost and that's all it has. The dark roast inherits from beverage. So there's a cost method that could use the cost of just the dark roast. We'll wrap that. This is called mocha. I called it chocolate because we think of a mocha as a particular kind of drink. So chocolate would be the way to add chocolate to an existing drink. So this, that's just the same thing. Uh, we're adding chocolate to the drink. And there's a cost to adding chocolate to a drink. So we will wrap the dark roast object inside of a mocha object. The mocha object cares about the cost of the mocha, the cost of the added coffee, not the cost of the dark roast. Then we wrap that 
inside of a whip or a whipped cream object so that now there are three different costs associated with the, the determination of the cost of the whole object. We're going to start from the outside, work our way inside, and work our way back outside, and end up with a sum of the total cost of the drink decorated with all of its condiments. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right, so how do we call these things? We have three cost methods. Do we call, which, which one do we call? How do we do it? How does it actually go through this calculation process? It ends up looking something like this. So we call the whips cost in this instantiated object. So maybe we have a drink D equals new beverage, or beverage D equals new beverage that has these components that have been added to it. So it looks like this. If we call the outermost decorated cost method, then that's going to call cost on this, which calls cost on this. This returns the associated cost of the dark roast. We then add the cost of the chocolate to that, and then we add the cost of the whipping cream to that, and get a final product that makes us wish it was that was still the cost of a dark roast with chocolate and whipped cream. When's the last time you could get a reasonable drink for $1.29? Long time ago, back when this textbook was written. <laughs> but luckily, these design patterns haven't changed since these drinks were $1.29. So that puts it in a little bit of perspective. So you can see how this is very much a recursive call and a recursive kind of going back from the base case of the recursion to calculate the total cost of the drink. So let's come up with a technical description of what this is and how to, how to do it. So the decorator pattern, if we're going to define it, a design pattern that attaches additional responsibility to an object dynamically. It's a flexible alternative to subclassing, which just means creating an inheritance hierarchy or extending functionality. That's just kind of a technical definition of the, of the decorator pattern. What does it look like in practice? So we should be able to draw UML diagrams for this, for how you actually create the decorator pattern within the classes that you create. So the hierarchy will look something like this. All right, so we have our abstract beverage class. Inheriting from this, we have all of the different types of coffee. Then we're going to make a decorator class that also inherits from beverage, but is also a component of a beverage. So because of this, we get a decorator as a, a, a field within beverage. Inheriting from the condiment decorator are all of the different kinds of condiments. They need a cost and a description because this has a description, so we need to overload this description for each description of each of these, which allows us to do things like if we have a beverage with multiple different condiments, this could say it is a dark roast with, and this description you can add to an existing description in this get description. It would be the super classes get description plus something. So this would allow you to say something like the drinks description is a house blend with milk and mocha and whip. And that would be the, the entire description of that, but it's made up of the components where they're anded together, where you have the words and in there, so that you can come up with a total string that describes that without having to describe that for each possible combination. You can construct it on the fly as you add things into the decorator. You can query for each element of the decorator, get its associated description, and add the word and in between each one. So that's the class hierarchy. The next question we should think about is how we're implementing cost. How would you write the cost method 
in beverage, in the concrete coffee types over there, and in the condiments. What does the cost look like? There's a cost method in everything except the condiment decorator. How do we actually implement that? So uh, but the condiment decorator is enabled inside of each condiment subclass. And then you return like the dot decorator plus 20 or whatever. But the, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That we want we want each one of these to be able to say what is the what is the cost. We're going to return the cost, and then the condiment decorator is going to know where the next thing is that it's going to query. Turn your your inner object plus. Yep. How about get description? We'll look at all the final code for this by the by the end of the day. We'll have code examples. We talked a little bit about having just the concept of that particular condiment, and then the decorator can query and throw things in the middle as needed. <clears throat> so just like before, we have Inheritance still here. So we didn't fully get rid of inheritance, right? We just added some composition into it. One important thing to note, you have a decorator, but the decorator, since it inherits from beverage, is a type of beverage. That seems really strange at first, because a decorator is not really a type of beverage, but it's important for things like type matching. If we eventually want to say, is this dark roast with mocha and whip the same object type as this decaf with caramel? The answer would be yes, they're both a beverage or yes, they're both a coffee. So we want to be able to, we don't want to lose that type when we, decorate it with the condiments. So we want to make sure that, that still matches. That's why that needs to be the case. It's like how the head and the list is still with them. Yeah. Yeah, it serves a slightly different purpose, but it needs to be the same type because we need to type, we need to be able to type match. If you think about writing an equals method for this, or something that would say yes or no, these are the same type of object. If your friend has a copy that is slightly different from your copy, you still both have copies. Do note, though, that none of the inheritance structure from this is defining any behavior whatsoever. It's defining what it is composed of, but it's not defining how it gets added. <clears throat> So this was the same with strategy. Whenever you're using inheritance like that, you don't want to use the inheritance to define behavior. You have the composition of multiple different decorator objects, and that's how the behavior is defined. I'm going to take just a few seconds for that to sink in. People have questions about using inheritance versus using inheritance and composition to remove the, the concept of behavior from your inheritance hierarchy and how that helps you. Because we get flexibility from this. Any beverage base type can have any subset of the condiments in the entire list. They can have nothing, you can just have a black coffee, a black house blend with no condiments on it. You can have a house blend with every condiment on it. It makes really flexible code. Yeah, that sounds great. One part coffee, 20 parts whipped cream. Sign me up, especially at a dollar twenty nine. <laughs> I'll take any combination of this at a dollar twenty nine at this point. 
Extendability is really important as well. If we think about trying to add new base drink types and or new condiments, how much work is it? And do we have to modify any of our existing code to be able to do so? If we go back to that inheritance hierarchy, we just add a new subclass of beverage if we're going to make a new base drink type. It can automatically be decorated with any list of the available condiments without having to specify that. We didn't have to write all of those fields. They just become objects that can be wrapped around that object because of the condiment decorator class. Similarly, if we wanted to make new condiment types, we just make the new class and the condiment decorator can already decorate any existing base drink type with that new condiment. We don't have to make any change to the existing code base and we can easily extend our code. We also get to define the behavior as the program is running. That means that we can decorate any existing drink with any number of condiments during runtime. We don't have to specify, if, if you think about like creating a new object, you have to specify the parameters in the driver program which happens before compilation. So if we were passing the condiment types as a parameter to a method, then we would have to have defined what that is in our code before, the, before we compile it. At runtime, we could query the user, select one for a house blend, select two for a decaf, select three for a something. And then during runtime, we could say, do you want this condiment on it? Do you want this condiment on it? Do you want this condiment on it? And based on the feedback that we get during runtime, we can construct the appropriate object as the user gives us that feedback in real time. So that is a significant benefit to this as well. We don't need to have specified that that particular combination exists. The user is capable of creating their own custom order as the program is running. Questions on the benefits of using the decorator pattern? Let's go to a code example that people don't have questions. All right, beverage superclass does not need to change at all. Here's all it looks like. So beverage is still abstract. Of course, we can't just instantiate a beverage. We can't make one of these things. If I said, student one, draw a beverage. Student two, draw a beverage. Student three, draw a beverage. You could all draw different things. Whether or not that beverage is a house blend or a decaf or something else, you might choose something else. It might have whipped cream on it or not. I'm choosing, I'm trying to choose the most visual, visually distinctive condiment. The whipped cream sits right on top. So someone might draw their drink with whipped cream. Someone else might draw their drink without whipped cream. So that's the easy way to determine whether or not a class should be abstract or not. If you're trying to instantiate a beverage, would everyone do it the same way? No, so it should be abstract. So we need the ability to have a base description, get the description. And of course, since it's an abstract beverage, we can't describe the beverage, right? If I say, describe to me the concept of the, the instantiation of a beverage, just like, I can't, I need more information to be able to do so, which is another way of thinking, this is a superclass. The cost at this point is also abstract because we don't even know the base type of the drink yet. So we have no ability to define anything with regards to the cost of an unknown beverage. So we leave it abstract. It will be defined in the subclasses. So we also need an abstract class for condiments. This is a condiment decorator. So we're going to leave an abstract description because again, we don't know exactly what it's made up of yet. So all condiment decorators need to have a get description for that's going to, that's gonna help us build what the, what the description of the actual beverage is. So these are our two abstract classes. 
because we can't instantiate them. Can you make a condiment decorator? It's an idea more so than an actual physical thing. So it needs to be abstract. Base beverages, we can kind of copy this. This is an espresso class. This is the house blend. They each have a constructor that sets the description and they each have a cost that returns the base cost of that object. So in this world, an espresso costs $1.99 and a house blend costs 89 cents, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the only thing I can think of that's cheaper than that are the coffee pods I use. So again, that's all there is to the classes. And we see that when we apply these design patterns in practice, our classes end up with very, very little in them, which is both a pro and a con of using design patterns. the actual condiment decorator subclasses for the condiments. So here's an example of the mocha. I called it chocolate, but for this, where I copied this from the book. So mocha extends the condiment decorator. So a mocha needs to contain a beverage, right? You add chocolate to a beverage. So if you're gonna wrap a mocha around a drink, then it needs to be composed of the drink which is kind of strange. You, you like to think of the drink having chocolate or not having chocolate. But when you decorate like this, the innermost object is the most concrete object. And then the outer classes are more and more abstract, like the, the condiment idea. So a mocha has a beverage. A beverage does not have a mocha. So that's a, that's a place that I think that a lot of people could get stuck a little bit in the understanding of this. But yeah, the, the condiment has a beverage that is associated with it. Because the beverage may have lots of different condiments associated with it. If you want to create a one-to-one -one relationship, then you need the condiment to be associated with the beverage. Because again, a beverage may have multiple condiments in it. So we have a field for the beverage. We need a constructor for the mocha object. So to construct a mocha object, we need to know which beverage it is associated with. We also don't know the type of the beverage. So we can't say anything about any of the beverage subclasses. Like we don't know this is a house blend. We don't know it's a decaf. We just know it is a beverage because a mocha can be added to any of those beverages. So we pass in a base beverage type rather than a concrete object. We then need a description. Note that the description has a comma there, and that allows us to be able to list all of the different types. So when we get the description of this, we're going to see that mocha is part of the description, and we will be putting together these pieces of the description as we construct all of the condiments of our beverage. The cost method needs to return the cost of adding chocolate to the drink, but then we also need to recursively call the beverages cost. Because it's going to be 20 cents plus the cost of whatever the beverage has to be. And we don't know what the beverage is. If the beverage is a house blend, it's going to add 89 cents. If the beverage is an espresso, it's going to add $1.99. Questions about the subclasses here of each each condiment, what those would look like, what they need, how you would do that. Everyone's so quiet. I, I assume full and complete understanding unless I'm unless I'm told otherwise. How would a driver class start to make beverages and calculate the cost of a beverage? So this is your main class or a driver class or something that's going to interact with these classes. How is that going to work? So we would do something like this. We have a main. A main is going to make a beverage and instantiate it with an espresso. We've seen this before where we have a superclass type 
instantiated with a subclass type. That's just polymorphism. We can print, what is the cost of this beverage? And we can jump into the beverages description and that will go and figure out the cost for us. We can now make, this is just a base beverage. It's just an espresso with no components to it. And it will just go grab the espresso's, the espresso's cost. So this should print $1.99. On the other hand, we can make a dark roast that has two shots of chocolate and one pump of whipped cream. So we're going to wrap the dark roast object that we made in a mocha, in another mocha, in another whip. And then when we call beverage two's get description, that's gonna go into the condiment decorator to grab that description, which is going to query for the descriptions of each of the condiments and print out the associated description and the associated cost of all of these things. And you know that we don't really need to design the entire recursive hierarchy for this. It just happens automatically with that single plus that we added to the cost in right here, where we say this plus, if we incorporated this for every object, it would just fall into place what that recursion looks like from the decorator path. We can then make a house blend that is wrapped in soy and mocha and whip. And then you can get the associated description and the associated cost. This is the basic way of doing something like this. And you can imagine that from the driver's perspective, this is kind of awkward because this is actually the client who has to type all of this. That is not ideal. And in fact, additional design patterns exist for this. You can see that when we cover the factory or builder, and actually builder is where we're going next, we can see some ways of abstracting this into another design pattern where the user makes a single call with some parameters. And that call is going to, there's, there's a, a director class that will direct the associated other classes to construct the object for us and return it. So rather than needing all of these lines, we'll have a single call to a director with a single order. So we can abstract out of making new lines for every single decorator that we make. Thoughts, questions, concerns? I have some concerns. <laughs> so how do we do something like all house blend orders are 30% off today? The answer is you can't. Once we decorate an object like this, and I'll go back to the code to show this. Once we make this dark roast and wrap it in a mocha and a mocha and a whip, we no longer have access to the fact that this is really a dark roast easily because this object is a whip on the outside, a mocha on the inside of that, a mocha on the inside of that, and a dark roast on the inside of that. We don't know how many layers we need to peel away. We don't know. We lose track of all of that. There's no easy way to keep track of that so that we can go grab. This is a dark roast object. The cost should be 30% off. So once we decorate the object, we lose the base object type. We know it's a beverage, but we don't know what type of beverage it is. So we need to modify our design if we're going to be able to account for something like this. And we'll talk about that as we go over more and more design patterns. So you can start to see how if you apply one design pattern, you leave some weaknesses that need to be covered by another design pattern, which leaves some weaknesses that need to be covered by another design pattern, which it's a continuous process where you end up with that FizzBuzz Enterprise Edition if you're not careful. Because you have so many different classes, so much is happening in the client code, there's lots of room for errors or exceptions as your user is creating their drinks. 
because you didn't write the code for that, there is no easy way to ensure that the client is using it correctly, which is again, why we have those other design patterns to offload that and make sure that there's no way that that can fail. So we'll be covering Builder Next and Factory in the next group of three design patterns that we talk about. And that will help us to be able to handle this. <clears throat> so a quick, snapshot of these ideas. We're going to be dealing with and creating the decorators when we call the constructor for the object. And that way the client code does not need to worry about decorating its own objects. There's some other class that will handle that for us. Sneak preview. You may also want a singular print method to be able to access all of the decorators. So you could do something that instead of seeing mocha comma mocha for that drink that had two shots of chocolate, you would want to be able to replace something like extra shot, extra shot with the words triple shot. So you could add some logic into the decorators to be able to replace the default construction of the drink description with some other shorthands or something that is easier to read or makes more sense. Nobody wants to order a drink, see the drink, extra shot, extra shot, extra shot, extra shot, extra shot, extra shot, extra shot. If you're me and need lots of coffee. If get description, return an array list rather than an individual string, then we could parse the array list at the point where it's returned and be able to look at the components of the array list and say, are any of these the same? If they are, what changes do we want to make to the description based off of the contents of the array list? So that would be a way that you could get around it and, and deal with it. To be able to use decorator, you need to be okay with the fact that you're writing a bunch of small classes that have next to nothing inside of them. We saw this with most of our classes, right? There was just a single method or a field and a method, and there was a single line inside of those methods or a field that didn't even get instantiated. And it feels very strange to have so many classes that do so little. Again, it's both a pro and a con. The pro is we get the flexibility and extension and all the, the benefits from the benefits slide. The con is that it's really difficult to understand without some kind of UML diagram to really look at it and see, oh, this inheritance hierarchy does this. I can see how and why this works. If you're just looking at a project in an editor and trying to understand why is this done this way without looking at a UML, then how are you supposed to figure out that this is the decorator pattern and that this is necessary for easy extension? You just look at that and say, who thought this up? So that's a big downside or a big trade-off. When we decide to use decorator, that's just the conceit that we need to make, the concession, whatever the correct word is. It's one thing to just look at this kind of in general or in, in an abstract form and seeing it applied to a dummy problem like this really simple coffee shop. So let's look at some classes that we've used before that actually in their implementation use the decorator pattern. The first one is if you've used any kind of input stream. Has anyone used a file input stream or something of the sort? So we have some kind of text file. To parse the text file, we use a file input stream, which is what a file object uses. One of the components of a file object, if you use a file object, is a file input stream that tells you where to read the, it tokenizes the contents of the text file. Wrapped around that is a buffered input stream. Wrapped around that is a line number input stream that keeps track of what line number you're on. So these things do exist. 
You can decorate, you can use a file input stream without any of this added behavior. But if you want to keep track of what line number you're on, you can wrap it with a buffered input stream and wrap that with a line number input stream. And then you can use the file input stream with line numbers. But you don't necessarily always want that behavior. So it's not put inside of the base class. It's done as kind of an option that you can wrap it with so that you can use that functionality if you need to. This gives you an idea of the entire system of input streams, and it's difficult to see. So let's zoom in on it a little bit. Here are all the different kinds of input streams. And this leads to kind of a, both a pro and a con of the Java programming language in general, is you read one of these and do you have any idea what it does? Just by the name. If I said, all right, a pushback input stream, what does that do? It's part of this bigger system. So it's really hard to understand pieces of the system without understanding the system at large. So that's just, that's kind of a con of Java's hierarchies. If you develop in Java, you will find yourself doing stuff like this to be able to create a big project with lots of moving parts and lots of options, which means that each piece of that puzzle is really hard to understand on its own. Questions or comments on this? Yeah. Why, we, why, why do we have two filter input streams uh, on the middle right and middle left? File input stream oh, and filter input mind. stream? That's just some dyslexia or something. You're good. They look very similar. Filter has file inside of it. <laughs> it's really confusing. You can see how, how difficult naming systems are too. You, you name something and it looks the same as something else, which makes it even, even at this level of abstraction, it can be hard to understand. All right, so this will also turn into a mini lab like the mini lab you have assigned right now. I wanted to take just a few minutes at the end of class rather than jump into Builder. I wanted to talk a little bit either about the lab or get a chance to answer questions that people have about the lab or the lab setup. Because I've been I've been getting a few questions about it and it seems like it would probably be worth spending the time to go over that. So who's had a chance to look at the lab so far? Most people. Have you had a chance to import it into IntelliJ and try to try to understand it at a base level? That's probably the first step. I don't know how much detail I want to get into until I have specific questions from people. But yeah, you can just go import the project and then it will show up as a file hierarchy, as a project. And then you just need to go in and create the actual classes that adhere to the API. What you've been given is an API. It tells you precisely the methods that you need to create. It tells you the classes that you need to create, what methods are part of what class, the associated parameter lists. So you don't need to figure out how to pass information back and forth. All of that's dictated by the API. So it's kind of a lab that is monkey see, monkey do, for lack of a better way of there's not a ton of critical thinking that needs to go into it, aside from that you need to adhere to the strategy design pattern, and you need to make sure that all of the implementation, all of, all of the logic that's in the API is filled out with actual logic. So fill in the methods with the associated logic question. Um, so the life form class, it's an abstract class. Um, this is one of the fields that says um, protected final in it, um, max life points. And if I have a final, like exactly how it is in the API, if I have a um, protected final, it throws an error. So if I get rid of final, it won't throw an error. Interesting. I'd have to take a look at that individually to see. But basically, somewhere it's attempting to be modified, probably. So if you get rid of final, it's like, all right, you can modify this. But if you keep final there, the question is just what's trying to access it or what's trying to modify it? I'll answer that after class, or I'll, I'll, I'll look at that after class.
Other yeah, questions or concerns? I, I heard it right. You need to test that are the tests that are already. Yeah, you can use those tests as an idea. You don't necessarily need to write something that's completely different, but if you notice a hole in a test that says that tests it for this value, but what about this value that might be different? You can write some tests for that. It's, it's never worth writing a test solely for having another test. But if you think about if this sequence of tests were run, what's not being tested? What is a potential input that could slip through the cracks of all of these tests and have an issue with it. So think critically about that test design. If you go through that process and get stuck, come talk to me and I can help you generate some ideas for some tests to write. I found myself only busy during part of my office hours today, which is the first time in a while I've had some time. And the entire time is everybody from compilers comes to see me, but I haven't assigned anything in this class yet. So feel free, I have those office hours and I, I love seeing people in those office hours. So rather than struggling by yourself or only talking to classmates, you're free to come stop by. I'd be happy to take a look at what you have so far, give you some ideas on how to proceed. But I'm hoping that these labs don't take too long. I will come back at some point and ask the class how long you spent on, on the lab. Not so much person by person, but if we have any individual communication, I'll be very curious to see how long did you spend on this lab? And that will give me an idea of one, where the class as a whole is, two, what is the associated difficulty of this lab given where you are and the prerequisite courses that you've taken, and three, how much trouble am I going to be in when I assign the lab from scratch that won't have an API that uses all three design patterns at some point next week? So we'll definitely be able to get there, but I think that is a very necessary part of the course to be able to generate and solve a real world problem by applying multiple design patterns to it. All right, that's basically all I have for the day. I know it's three minutes, technically three minutes before, but I can answer any individual questions that people have about the lab or concerns you have about the course, questions about the APE, since that's happening tomorrow, we're studying for the eighth. So if that's at all useful to people, come talk to me and let me know. And otherwise, I will see you tomorrow for, maybe we'll have a programming day, maybe we'll have a work in class day on the lab to let you get started on that and get stuck. We'll figure out some way to be productive and not introduce a ton of new stuff. Yeah, what time does it start? In one, so I mean, we're done. Okay, yeah, we can end a little bit early tomorrow too, so that people can make sure you get to the eight. All right, see you all tomorrow.